If you're involved in a disability claim, you undoubtedly need health care. But do you know how to choose a good doctor? Do you know how to choose a good hospital? In my experience, many people don't. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Hello, my name is John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. I've done over 1,500. And as usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study, and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. I was going to give my second part talk on disability and arthritis today, but a viewer asked a question about finding a doctor, and that reminded me that I've seen so many people choose doctors and hospitals for the wrong reason. So I'm going to postpone that talk till next week. So why does anybody need a doctor or hospital anyways? Well, I'd say the first one reason is to keep from dying. The second reason is to get treatment so that your condition gets better, or at least doesn't get worse, or if getting worse is inevitable, at least slow down that getting worse as much as possible. And the more serious your condition is, the more important staying alive and getting the best treatment is. Now, most doctors are reasonably good. A few are excellent, and a few are terrible. Doctors are people, just like anyone else. Some of them have addictions. Some of them have serious mental health problems. Some of them are interested in mostly how much money they can make. A few, but some, are psychopathic. The biggest problem I see with doctors is lack of knowledge. After medical school and training, it's very important to continue to study for the rest of one's career. Most doctors do this, but a significant minority don't. They fall behind in their knowledge and may have graduated reasonably good, but become less good as time goes on. Now, there's two things people look for in a doctor. The first is a good bedside manner. Basically means, is this a nice person or not? Will they answer my questions? Can I talk with them? Are they comforting when I'm upset? The second reason is competence. Does this person know what they're doing? Do they do what's necessary skillfully? Those two things don't always occur in the same physician. When they do, it's wonderful. But here's something I've seen. All too often, people choose the doctor based solely on bedside manner alone. I have to say, one of the least knowledgeable, least competent doctors I saw was just the nicest person, had a wonderful bedside manner, and had a huge practice. But their lack of medical knowledge was awe-inspiring. Until I met them, I never knew it was possible for a doctor to know such so little about medicine. That was brought home to me when I was working in the emergency department, had one of their patients come in having an acute heart attack, called them in, and they asked me if it would be okay to send the patient home because, in their own words, they were feeling better. My opinion is, if I had a serious medical condition or needed a serious op operation, I'd rather have an obnoxious SOB who was highly competent than a really nice person who was less than competent. So here's some things to look for in a doctor. You can choose a young doctor or an old doctor. A very long time ago when I was a medical student, I stopped one of the older professors in the hall and told him I was upset because patients didn't believe me because they thought I was too young. He laughed and said, they don't believe me because they think I'm too old and out of date. You can never win. And he had a point. Young doctors lack experience. They haven't seen lots and lots of patients. But they generally have the latest, most up-to-date knowledge. Older doctors have experience. They've seen or operated on lots and lots of patients. 
but they're usually not up to date with all the latest medical knowledge. As I've grown older, the main change I've found is that experience has made me more cautious. One thing I think that's absolutely essential in a doctor is that they answer questions and use language that you understand. If a doctor won't answer your questions, I would find somebody else. On the other hand, a good, honest doctor will respond to questions with, I don't know, frequently. There's so much doctors don't know about the human body and medicine that it's staggering. If you get a doctor who has an answer for everything and never says they don't know, they're probably lying and making things up and I would find somebody else. The next thing is, does the doctor examine you? It seems to me that all young doctors do these days is stare at their laptop and order tests. They hardly ever look at the patient and do a teeny tiny physical exam. In my opinion, if you have a serious problem, the doctor should have you get undressed and do a physical exam. And if they don't, I'd look elsewhere. Tests are no substitute for a good physical exam. Patients often think that if a doctor's been sued for malpractice, they must be a bad doctor. Well, in the United States in 2023, any doctor who's been practicing for any length of time has probably been sued at least once. And OBGYNs, doctors who deliver babies, and neurosurgeons, brain surgeons, get sued the most. It's almost impossible to be one of those specialists and not get sued. So lawsuits don't necessarily mean a bad doctor. Being late doesn't necessarily mean a bad doctor. Emergencies are unpredictable and sometimes doctors are late because of emergencies. And sometimes doctors are late because they're kind people. Uh, when I did my last day of social security disability exams. I was running a bit behind and at the very end of the exam I had a patient bring up a very emotional topic which obviously they'd never been able to talk to any, anyone about before. Well I could have told them your time's up get out of here but I thought that would have been utterly heartless so I got behind by an, about another 10 minutes letting this person talk about what had been bothering them for a long time. In medicine, there's a thing called the by the way syndrome, which is the visit is done, the patient gets ready to leave, and as they're walking out the door, they say, oh, by the way. And that, oh, by the way, tends to be the patient bringing up their most important concern, what they really went to the doctor for in the first place. Again, you can't just kick such a patient out the door because you're late. Here's something I've found about doctor groups and hospitals. Good doctor groups attract good doctors and repel bad doctors. That's because if a bad doctor joins a good doctor group, the good doctors will soon realize that doctor is incompetent and he may kick them out, or the bad doctor may realize their incompetence is glaringly evident and leave on their own. Likewise, bad doctor groups attract bad doctors because they fit right in and get rid of good doctors because the good doctors show up the bad doctors incompetence. And the same applies to hospitals. Good hospitals attract good staff and repel bad staff. Bad hospitals attract bad staff and repel good staff. So if you know a doctor in a group and they're quite good, the odds are everyone else in the group that they work for is good as well. Next, beware of online reviews. Most online reviews are left 
by the minority of people who are unhappy with a doctor or hospital. The people who are reasonably satisfied rarely take the time to write an online review. And as I've said many times, medicine isn't like Burger King. You don't always get to have it your way. To be a good doctor, you often have to go against the patient's wishes. Examples are advising people that they need to cut down on their alcohol consumption or stop smoking, or refusing to prescribe an addict the drug that they're addicted to. I say, if you had a friend who was an alcoholic and had liver cirrhosis, would you think much of their doctor if they prescribed them a pint of vodka a day? Well, it's the same with addictive drugs like Oxycontin or Xanax. My best advice for finding a doctor is to find out which doctor doctors go to or take their family members to, or which doctors do nurses go to, especially nurses who work in the hospital, because they tend to interact with a large number of doctors and they know who's good and who isn't. Now, two things about primary care doctors and specialists. I think everyone should have a primary care doctor, either a family doctor, internist, pediatrician, or OBGYN. That's especially important when the person has multiple complex problems and sees many specialists. In that situation, you want one doctor who sees the whole picture and is what we call the captain of the ship. Otherwise, you can have too many cooks spoiling the broth and nobody really knowing what the other guy's doing. The best system I've ever seen was when I was practicing in Canada, where everyone had a primary care doctor and only saw specialists for consultations or surgery. If the patient was admitted to the hospital, their primary care doctor saw them every day. If they had surgery, the primary care doctor was in the operating room and assisted the specialist surgeon. Today in the United States, often a patient will be admitted to the hospital, have surgery, and their internist or family doctor will never even hear about it until the patient shows up in their office. In Canada, not only do you know that your patient had surgery, you were actually there and saw their diseased gallbladder or their cancer or whatever. Since the turn of the millennium, primary care doctors have been pretty much kicked out of United States hospitals, and I think that's a huge mistake. You want your primary care doctor to know about, as much about you as possible, who you are, your medical history, what medicines you take, what allergies you have, the times you've been in the hospital, what happened in the hospital, and the operations you've had. So now I want to talk a bit about hospitals. And I added it up last night, and as far as I can recall, I've actually worked in 27 different hospitals in my lifetime, including my training and my practicing years. And I've worked in everything from a tiny little 12-bed hospital in a little town that advertised itself as the end of the world to a great big huge 2,000-bed urban hospital. And I've worked in some really great hospitals and a few terrible hospitals. I have found that most patients judge the hospital by how pretty and clean it is, and I can't think of a worse thing to choose a hospital on. In my experience, some of the best hospitals I've worked in were pretty shabby and run-down looking, but they treated lots and lots of hospitals and their staff was really experienced and really knew what they were doing. The most important feature of a hospital 
is not its fancy high-tech equipment or its beautiful lobby or rooms. It's the staff who work there. And by the staff, I don't just mean the doctors and nurses. All of the staff are very important to patient care. That includes the people who prepare the food. A lot of patients require very specialized diets. The people who do the lab tests. I worked as a lab technician part-time while I was in medical school to help pay for it. And there's good lab technicians and there's bad lab technicians. Even the people who clean the rooms are important to patient care in a hospital. And like I said, good hospitals attract and keep good staff and repel bad staff and bad hospitals attract and keep bad staff and repel good staff. Another unfortunate thing that's happened since the mid 80s to 90s is that American community hospitals by and large have gone the way of the dodo and now most hospitals are run by large for-profit chains. It used to be that each town had a community hospital that was a non-profit organization and had a board of directors composed of people who lived in the town. Several doctors, usually several executives, like the president of the local bank, the principal of the local school. If you had a serious problem with the hospital, you could go and sit down and meet with those one of, the, one of those people, and they'd care about your problem and take care of it. Nowadays, if you have a problem with a hospital, you've probably got an 800 number in Houston to call and be lucky if somebody even answers the phone within two hours. Because these hospitals are for profit, in many cases, the almighty dollar is their primary interest, not patient care. In fact, some of these hospitals describe patients as profit centers. If your mom had to go into the hospital for serious cancer surgery, would you like the director of the hospital to view her as a profit center or as a very sick woman who needed top quality care? I would recommend a local nonprofit hospital if one's available in your area. If you have a good doctor, they would be the best person to ask about hospitals. Likewise, if you have any nursing friends who work in the hospital, I'd ask them as well. Now, a word about teaching hospitals. Most hospitals are non-teaching, but some hospitals are. That means they're affiliated with a medical school and get medical trainees, which includes medical students, interns, residents, and fellows. These are people who are doing their medical training but have not yet finished. The advantage of a teaching hospital is that they tend to have the smartest doctors and the latest technology. When I was a medical student in the 70s, one of the hospitals I trained in had the latest technology they had the only CT scanner in Canada. Nowadays, of course, every little small town hospital has a CT scanner, but at that time, the only place you could get a CT scan done was at a teaching hospital. The disadvantage is that you are considered what is called teaching material. That means that medical students and other trainees will learn from you. And that may mean that sometimes 20 medical students and other trainees will parade into the room and examine you, especially if you have interesting things to see. Well, as one patient told me, doctors have to learn somehow, and re reading about medical conditions in a book is kind of sort of okay but nothing sticks in your mind like seeing an actual patient with a problem. Finally, I want to talk about what are called super specialists. 
These are doctors who specialize in one tiny area of medicine. They're best used for patients who have rare or unusual or very difficult to diagnose conditions. For example, there's a terrible disease of the spinal cord called transverse myelitis that's quite rare. I've only seen about two or three patients with it in my 44 years of practice, and I've never seen a child with it. Well, I was looking it up on YouTube, and I found that there's one female pediatric neurologist in the United States who specializes in transverse myelitis, sees patients with it all day. And she is the person to see if your child gets this terrible disease. And for most serious but rare conditions, such a doctor exists. The best way to find them, I've found, is through online patient forums. On the flip side, you don't need a super specialist for routine care. I always tell people about the very rich Texas oil man who went to an ear, nose, and throat super specialist twice a year to get his ear wax cleaned out, something that any family doctor in any small town could do with their eyes shut. He did it just to have bragging rights for his friends. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.